Well, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, for those of you who already have my book, thank you for getting my book. Um, this material may sound somewhat familiar. Um, and uh, I think um, I'm shooting to speak for about 45 minutes and which is, I'm gonna start a timer to remind myself and uh, leave something like a half hour for uh, conversation ideally, um, unless I get long-winded or <laughs> take up more time presenting than I expected. Um, so we'll see how that goes. And, and if everybody's silent, and there's no questions, then maybe we won't, won't take the whole time, but we'll see. Um, these things tend to, to uh, be elastic and fill, fill the, the time allotted. Um, one thing about the title, uh, and um, I, I've, I've run a workshop under the same heading, so you want to be a product manager. And one of the things I did at the beginning of the workshop was just I asked everybody, do you want to be a product manager? Because uh, these were UX people taking the workshop for the most part. And um, as I recall, at least the last time I did the workshop, about a third of them were considering becoming a product manager. And at least more than half of them, almost two thirds said, no, I don't really want to become a product manager. I just am interested in the subject and I want to understand it better. Um, I work with product managers or I'm on a product team. And, uh, and I was sort of secretly very pleased because I wanted to address both people who definitely know that they are thinking about becoming a product manager and help people sort of figure out whether they want to do that and what that would entail. Um, and at the same time, I very much do want to kind of uh, help people trained in UX understand where product management folks are coming from and how to work with them better and how product teams work when UX and product is aligned um, and how to deal with some of the very common situations where they're not. So uh, I'll try to address all of that in some ways. So you can think of it as empathy building if it's not the thing that you specifically want to do. Um, but if you are, you know, coming, uh, you know, sort of through the SVC world and thinking about a career in design, a, a UX career, um, then uh, product management is sort of adjacent to UX on the other side from the design side of UX, you might say, and um, and might be something that you start to hear about or notice or think about and is a potential career direction that that uh, at least people with certain sets, sets of interests and aptitudes, you know, uh, can consider. So those are, those are a couple of frames that we can kind of share as we talk about these things together. Um, I'm very happy to be here at the School of Visual Concepts. I think my my visuals may not be quite as mature as my concepts, but you can be the judge of that part. Um, so here's a very misleading uh, Venn diagram that um, you may have seen before. It's sort of maybe the most popular or most common shorthand that um, the product management world uses to describe what it does to itself and to other people. And it's problematic in certain ways, um, not least of which because I, I, I would wager that pretty much every discipline in the world could make a diagram that puts them at the center at the intersection of a bunch of other things and the other things kind of being peripheral and not not what they do um and you know certainly all the years that i was a ux designer or ux manager or ux director i could have drawn a zen a venn diagram that had ux at the center and a bunch of things overlapping there so sort of just bear that in mind that that's a a kind of a, a somewhat misleading somewhat mislabeled really crude breakdown of the idea that product management people have to be savvy about UX and aware of it in some ways, at least they, they, they say that they will be or should be, um, that they have to be obviously, you know, techno technologically literate um, and that they, and the thing that they're best known for typically is, is having a business head, looking at things from a business perspective, being a bean counter, uh, keeping the lights on, things like that. Um, and somewhere at the intersection of those things is where a lot of product managers work. Um, like I said, this, this uh, diagram is so common that it has spawned a thousand different memes, and, and this is just one, one uh, uh, interpretation of it. Um, another interpretation is this uh, screen grab from a presentation that Peter Merholtz did. Um, he and I have discussed this a bunch because he strongly believes that UX isn't really a job or a title, but a lens or a, or a, um, a set of values and, 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 and uh, concepts. Um, and that the thing that gets labeled UX in that diagram a lot of the time is really design uh, and UX is in there in the middle and that product is just another name for UX. And I think that that's uh, aspirational and has some truth to it. It's true on some teams, for instance, um, but there's a lot of environments where, the, where what the product managers are doing and what the UX designers are doing are not the same thing. And so even if we agree that philosophically UX and product are very, um, have a lot in common, they're both ways of kind of wrapping your arms around what are we making, 
who are we making it for? Is it valuable? Do they like it? Will they keep using it in ways to answer those questions and probe the, the possibilities? Um, but they come from different schools of thought. They, 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 they overlap in some ways and don't in others. And that's sort of what we'll be getting into. Um, so, you know, UX versus PM, um, who, who will win? Um, two may enter, one will leave, something like that. Uh, no. So uh, let's think just a little bit about um, if you know what UX designers do, or if you are a UX designer, then you probably have a picture in your head of what that job is like, or, or what many of the tasks are that you do. Um, maybe you're involved with user research directly, or certainly it, you consume it. Um, maybe you sometimes use sticky notes in your job, um, and uh, you know maybe you do some sketching, maybe you make some diagrams, um, maybe you do design iterations and design sprints and things like that. Um, but what do product managers do, especially if these are supposed to be such similar things? What's the life of a product manager like? Um, and before I delve into that idea of like, you know, uh, uh, designers are from Venus and product managers are from Mars or something like that, um, I do sort of want to step back and again, sort of put my arms around the whole idea of product strategy, of, of talking about a product team where everybody is working together to make a digital product, uh, whatever that means. Um, and if we're going to talk in those terms, then I think it's fair to say that your user researchers or your UX researchers or your researchers are product researchers. They're not researching, you know, greenhouse emissions or something like that. They're researching things to, to that will inform the, the making a great product. And your UX designers and 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 whether they're you know interaction designers or visual designers or information architects or or, or any combination of those things can be thought of as product designers. They're, they're helping to design a digital product. They're not designing an ad campaign. They're not designing a car. They're designing a digital product. Um, the engineers on the team, likewise, they're not making embedded systems. They're not making rocket ships. They're making websites. They're making digital products. They're making apps and interactive experiences, and which we're calling a product for the sake of this discussion. So the product manager isn't really the only product person on the team. They're not the only person doing product, thinking about product, thinking in terms of product. They, they have it in their name and they're the ones brandishing that as a frame. And so they owe it to everybody else to explain what they're talking about when they say product and, and what it means to have a product mindset or what makes a good product. Um, but just be aware that if you're gonna talk in those terms, just like if you say everybody cares about UX or everybody's involved in making sure the experience is good, whether they're a designer or not, uh, in the same way, everybody on the product team is, is engaged in the same effort, which is making a great product. Um, now, having said that, product managers do have specific roles and tasks that they're often more responsible for, or more directly doing that the designers are, don't tend to be doing. Um, uh, product managers usually sit at the crux of decision making, either having sometimes to make a lot of decisions, especially small ones that have to be made constantly. Um, and then as decisions get weightier, they tend to be ensuring that the decision gets made, that it gets made in a rigorous way, um, and that the right people are making the decision or are involved in it. That's when it's done well. Um, it's not always done well, but sitting closer to the decisions is, is a hallmark of product management. Um, you know, the, the UX designer famously, uh, one of the probably the, the most common stereotypes is the sort of the joke about the answer to everything being it depends because it requires more research because uh, I think the, the question doesn't really uh, say enough and things like that. And, and uh, you know, all those kinds of jokes have a kernel of truth to them, which is that uh, the UX um, and user-centered design uh, mission is to push for more research, to better understanding, taking your time and being, you know, and, and, and coming up with crafting a solution. And some of the other partners in this work have other values. Um, and, and sometimes it's about moving fast and sometimes it's about taking risks and, and things like that. So um, the, uh, there's jobs that don't have quite as easy a time saying it depends or I'll get back to you or we need to do more research. Um, it's, it's actually uh, the kind of job product managers are, are, are the ones who are asked by the boss or somebody to come up with it, an answer or a decision. Um, sorry, I was a little distracted by some sound. Um, if any of you remember the, the reboot of Star Trek from the 90s, um, the, there's this episode I, I recall that I always feel it's a great example of sort of the kind of thing product managers have to do sometimes, which is we've got we've got the captain and the doctor. They're stranded on a planet together. They're they're isolated for a while till they can be rescued and have to kind of find their way in the wilderness. Um, and the planet has this property that it it actually makes them uh, read each other's minds just passively. They're hearing all of each other's thoughts, and it's very embarrassing. Hilarity ensues because they can't keep secrets from each other anymore, um, and because they once had a, a crush a long time ago or something like that. No pun intended. 
And um, along the, you know, at a certain point when they're lost and trying to decide whether they should go up a hill or down into a valley to get where they're trying to go, uh, the captain very decisively makes a decision and says something like, oh, we'll go this way, and he points. And because um, the, Dr. Crusher can read his mind, she, um, she says, you don't actually know. You know you're, you, that, you're just guessing. You, know, you just acted like you knew what you were doing. And he basically has to almost as a captain break character and admit that in, in leadership, you can't always have perfect information. You can't always know for sure, but you sometimes have to still give people focus or give them direction or make sure that it, you know, basically make the decision if somebody has to make it. Um, another thing that product managers often bring to the table is this lean um, ideas inherited from, um, you know, lean startups, uh, the idea of build, build, measure, learn. Um, so get something out into the field, um, measure its impact. Are people using it? Do they like it? Are they recommending it? learn from that experiment and then build a new thing. Um, and I think that there's a lot, there's a lot of value in that um, mindset. It can, um, as I said, it can sometimes break the log jam of endless research and get you out in the field and learning stuff from actual users. Um, but it can also sometimes be a way of not really learning um, or, and, and just mindlessly building. Um, it can sometimes be a, something that involves skipping uh, the design step and just getting, just building something so you can learn, learn on, on real users. Um, and it then, therefore, sometimes it requires close coordination between the product management side and the design side to make sure that you've got either design sprints or some sort of dual track process um, that keeps things all in alignment. Um, a big part of what product managers also have to do is um, you know, persuade engineering teams who don't report directly to them usually to build what they want and to help them understand how long it's going to take to do it and whether things are on track and whether the quality is going to be good enough and whether the requirements are clear and things like that. Um, I'd say a lot of UX people, it's a technical job. You deal with engineers, you, you, you struggle to get your designs built. So none of this is foreign, I think, or unfamiliar to people for, with a design background. But the product manager is often more accountable for what the engineers do directly. Uh, and again, without being able to directly bo actually boss people around, um, but simply by having to make the case that this is the right thing to do and, and that it makes sense and that you've, you've uh, listened to everybody. Um, as I said, uh, uh, it's not just with engineers, everybody you work with as a product manager has to be brought on board with the ideas of, you know, the, the plan, the, the goals. Uh, this includes both people directly on the core team, people on the larger team, stakeholders. Um, it, a big part of the job is about communication, um, a lot more sort of sending emails or responding to Slack messages than updating, you know, Figma um, mocks and things like that. Um, what else do product managers do? Okay, so so what are some of the differences? Well, um, I like to sort of visualize it this way. Um, and it's an exercise that I've done. I think an individual can do this sometimes as a self-assessment and it's useful if you're trying to think about what you like to do and what you're interested in. And also as a manager of a, of a team and as a, somebody building a team uh, with a mixed set of skills, it's something that I first started using to break out of uh, very oversimplified um, divisions of labor, like people saying we need a UX designer and a UI designer. And I would say, well, it's all UX, first of all, and I think you mean visual designer maybe, and also we need an interaction designer, but we need a prototyper, but we also need somebody who's good at front end development, and we also need researchers. And so it becomes this longer and longer list of things that, that fall in some way or another under the heading of UX design. And I think everybody's list would be different every company's list would be different. You might visualize what the, what the skills are the, or that you need and, and what your approach is or your methodology. You might also have different ideas of how granular you need to be. Maybe one thing is a subset of something else and you don't need to break it out. So in these next couple of slides, there's nothing about my list that I'm showing on this screen that is particularly a determinative, but it's an example. So we've got a spectrum of things here. Sorry if you to turn your head sideways to see it like this. Um, and they roughly run the, the, the slightly darker purple ones are, are the more strategic, the more um, information architecture, research concept, concept modeling, the, the positioning, the figuring out of the problem space, the understanding side of things. And the things of the lighter color are a little bit more of the actual making, doing, the craft side of things. And it's oversimplification and it's not linear uh, and everybody could make their own list and put it in a different order, which is very roughly that, that, that sort of a spectrum and a lot of, people in UX might feel themselves gravitating more to one end or the other, or being in one area, but being more interested in learning more about some of the other things on that list. Once again, I think you can make your own list here. It's actually an exercise I do with people in workshops sometimes. 
And then if I were to make my own self-assessment, I'd say, yeah, I, I barely know anything about sound and motion design or front-end development. I give myself the lowest score. I think it's like a one to nine scale here. Um, and, and I could do a little bit of branding, but I, I wouldn't hire me. Um, you know, but there's other things I'm much better at UX strategy or, or UX writing or things like that. So I, I score myself higher on those things. Um, now you can continue this list of tasks or skills or proficiencies further you know, uh, on this, like I said, this other side of the spectrum. Um, well, my computer wants to go to sleep, don't do that. And just continue listing out some of the other things that product managers do or are involved with. So they do, they get out and talk to customers. They do market research to try to understand the sizes, size of markets and how to address them. Um, they, they look at a lot of data and, and do analysis or get help from data an, an, an analysts to decipher and understand the data. They are often involved in sprint planning and doing some, sometimes the things that we think of as product owner roles that are, that are more about the agile scrum process and, and the, the weekly planning and things like that. They figure out what should be the target metrics, the North Star metrics. Uh, they decide when something's good enough to, you know, whether it meets the criteria and can be shipped or, or move to the next stage. Um, they help write the user stories or write them themselves or are involved in driving that. They are usually responsible for the roadmap. And uh, you know, I'm not going to read my whole screen to you, but there's a bunch of things here that product managers do. And in my career, as I gravitated from a UX person and leading UX teams to a product management leader leading combined product and UX teams, I had to fill in a lot of gaps, things that I'd never really done before. But in small enough startups, even if I had a fancy boss title, I was actually having to do a lot of individual contributor work. And along the way, I had to have people teach me some of these things that I'd never done. I'd never done any revenue modeling before, for instance, things like that. So that's my, this is how I rank myself across these other product management skill areas. Um, take it all with a grain of salt. It's been a while since I actually made this slide. And then if you chop off those things that are more, as I said, production and craft oriented in the making of the interface part, and you include some of those things in the middle that are typically thought of as UX work, but are also, I think, in, 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 in the orbit of a product manager, I think that's where you sort of, that's how you see shifting over and saying, oh, this is what product managers do compared to what UX people do, or this is where the, the focus of attention shifts. Um, so if you do UX now, or you've been trained to do UX, or you're thinking about doing UX, or you're in the middle of a UX career, but you're also thinking about, well, the product manager seems to be the boss here, or um, product management work looks interesting to me, or, uh, you know, uh, they get to make decisions or they get to go to the meetings or, you know, I'm tired of pushing pixels or any other kinds of things like this. Then I want to sort of talk about two sides to that. And one is where your UX training stands you in good stead and will actually help you be a product manager, things you can kind of just take directly into the product management role and, and apply usefully, if only as a, a way of understanding things, even if you're not always practicing all the same crafts. Um, and then after we talk about those things, we can talk about the things that don't come naturally from a UX career, uh, where if you really want to get serious about product management, you'll have to do some remedial work and fill in some gaps where you may not have had, had any experience yet. And typically it's more on the technical and business side of things, as you can imagine. So one of the things I like to say is that the kind of IA skill set, the information, you know, the, the diagram maker, or the, the person who can figure out how a, a complex system relates what an ecosystem looks like, what a user journey looks like, who can map things out. Those skills all really help in product management, I find, because a lot of a product manager's job is making sure that the whole team agrees and understands, like, what are we making? What's it for? What's it supposed to do? What does success look like? And if you can visualize things, if you can make them spatial, if you can diagram them dynamically on a whiteboard till everybody agrees or in a nice diagram that people can refer to later, then that mapping skill I have found is like a really nice superpower as a product manager. Um, there, there's others like that. There's, you know, um, using the, the art skills as, to visualize ideas and help people understand them, using the, the, the writing, the, the technical writing or, or copywriting or UX writing skills to, to find the right way to, to you know, get everybody to understand an idea. Um, just the, basically the, the so-called design thinking pro, you know, way of solving problems, the creative problem solving bag of tricks all can be used as a, by a product manager. Um, often in, in getting alignment between user-centered uh, research from a UX team and product-oriented uh, market and customer research is sometimes a challenge. Often they're running on separate tracks and not working well together, but there's a huge opportunity to get that together. And I think the user research skill set and also the general UX skills around you know, interpreting research, understanding it, building building kind of a, a, an, a picture of an entire system 
again, are all things that, you know, should be recognized as valuable by product managers and whether they have, if they have that skill, if you're going into the field, if you're becoming a product manager and you can do that, that's going to help you a lot. Um, product managers out there who don't have those skills should be learning to turn to their user researchers, to turn to their UX people to, to, to help figure out that sort of strategic level. Um, I mentioned the IA part already and similarly content strategy, the ability to kind of figure out the right way to structure the, the words, the taxonomy, the ideas. Um, uh, product managers are often obs obsessed with data, you know, metrics, the numbers that you're, you're tracking against, that your success metric, you know, the, the, how you're determining whether you're hitting your goals or being successful or not. And that can sometimes lead to a real uh, missing the forest for the trees problem where you obsess about the facts, the what, where numbers just went down, then you know, something happened where we're losing signups or, or there's a problem or something good's happening, but we don't understand why. Um, when you have to figure out why, you're basically back in the realm of research again and qualitative research of coming up with a hypothesis and then inquiring out, out in the field, doing, doing, you know, doing, talking to people, doing ethnographic research or putting a survey in the field or maybe running an experiment. I mean, it, there's a whole bag of tricks there, but um, I think the, the UX ability to try to figure out the explanation for what's happening rather than just a, a bunch of raw facts um, is helpful for product managers. Um, product managers are heavily involved in setting priorities uh, in, in um, you know, deciding like what gets into this sprint and what gets onto the roadmap and whether, whether you know, and, and largely speaking, what, what the team should focus on. Um, and I found that most UX designers or UX strategists that, you know, certainly um, have that set of skills, uh, that ability to get a bunch of people together to uh, come up with ideas to put them up on a wall to figure out some kind of rubric for ranking them and scoring them or voting on them and then ultimately you know clustering them and all those sorts of things. These are all ordinary parts of being a UX designer and exactly the same technique or or very similar techniques are used to prioritize a roadmap or prioritize a sprint. Um, and then just that ability to sort of take a step back and and do do inquiry and understand context and put things in a larger frame and sort of do the the narrative um, that I think a good UX designer has to do that it goes back to that idea of synthesis and being able to build a larger system idea um, that's very very helpful for product managers who have to communicate to stakeholders coming from every single different direction about what the point of it is that we're all working on together. Um, there's also issues that typically happen right now in a lot of product shops where the UX designers and product managers are stepping on each other's toes. There's some sharp elbows. There's disagreements about who should do what. I mentioned already different ideas about research, for instance, that can lead to problems like bugging the same customer two different times, uh, appearing to be disjointed, uh, things like that. Um, there can, you know, literally can be like, who does the wireframe, you know, or, or how soon is the designer included in the process and, you know, resentment over things like that. Um, I like to sort of emphasize that these are solvable problems and they're problems that, that, that are actually part of the work that we all have to do if you're a UX designer or if you're a product manager, um, because really there's no one size fits all recipe out there. There's no book you can buy that says, here's how you set up a team. There should be this many UX designers and this many researchers and this many engineers and this many QA people and this many product managers down the list. And here's exactly who's responsible for what. Um, there's broad ideas about that and companies should definitely have their points of view on that and figure it out at a company level. But I found that at the team level, you still have to work it out because everybody's different. It doesn't matter what their job titles are. They have a different set of past experiences and things that they're really good at and things that they love and bad experiences they've had in the past that have made them shy of doing certain things now. And so if you find yourself um, as a product manager now finding those old UX designers like you used to be hard to work with, um, or as a UX designer, if you're bumping into product managers and finding them, you know, it's confusing why they say no to stuff or why they seem to be in charge of decisions you think you should be in charge of. I think part of our work nowadays in this field is to be sorting that out together, to be actually like figuring out where you disagree and, and, and negotiating it and, and, and actually, you know, realizing that the whole team should be involved and informed, but at different times, different people on the team might be more accountable for a certain decision or a certain process. And that's okay. You should be able to kind of hand it around and, 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 and not feel like this is one discipline dominating over all the rest. Um, you can actually do teams and I've helped again, teams that are stuck in this way, get, in, get up on a whiteboard together, list out the things that they, that they think need to be done 
sort them into piles about who they think does what, um, figure out where the disagreements are, and then negotiate at least temporary you know, agreements on what to do for now, what to do in the next set of experiments, in the, the next iteration. Uh, you know, okay, you think you should do the wireframes, fine, you do the wireframes, and we'll, we'll revisit this, this decision later. Um, but if you articulate them and, and bring those things to the surface, then um, there's a much better chance of, of, of folks working together. So aspirationally, I think a product manager should be doing that. I think in reality, product managers are dropping the ball there a lot and just walking into the room and telling people what to do. But I think a really good product manager is realizing that the way the team works itself is something you have to be agile and iterative about and is, is helping to kind of surface that stuff. You know, so again, the teams are going to figure out different models of who does what. Um, some folks I was just talking to recently, they kind of sorted it this way, a, a bunch of these uh, details, but it, it kind of can vary from team to team. And that's probably my biggest point about, about the differences between the jobs. Um, I think we need to be aware that making stuff on the internet is, is, has only been around for a couple of decades and, and all of these jobs are semi made up or, or have just come into being in the, in the last 15 to 20 years. So there's no real strict hard and fast rules about, about any of these things. At the same time, I'm not a nihilist. We have to have, you know, agreements on what we're doing for now, what we think these words mean and, and how we work, you know, for the next quarter or so. So you have to work out these temporary arrangements if nothing else. Um, uh, another area, again, like I have mentioned before, is that user research is a place where product management and, and UX really kind of stand together. And the UX background really comes in useful. Uh, and as a product manager, I, when I started doing product management work, I really felt that um, the user-centered design training from my UX career was probably my strongest uh, lens. It was the thing that made other people say, oh, you have great product sense. You just seem to look at this website and you could tell what's wrong with it and I'm like oh yeah the interface sucks and a normal person would be confused trying to get around and like oh it's amazing you know so much about products so i was like okay great i guess i'm good at product um i talked about this already but if you can if you can use that ability to to kind of draw the map that gets the whole team to to understand and agree on what we're shooting for what we're making if you, you get the words right then um that ux design skill set is is super useful for a product manager um, talked already about so you go from your your factoids, your data information that you're studying, um, uh, and then you go and you try to understand what what and why, why is that happening? Um, is is are these numbers going up because they're going up for everybody? Uh, is it just seasonal, or are we doing something right? Um, are they going down because we broke something, or is there a recession happening? Um, you know, so it's that deeper inquiry into understanding the, the, the facts um, that design research is sort of brings to the table and that um, once you sit, if you're wearing a product management hat, uh, you now sort of have that aptitude or that openness to it rather than kind of maybe the defensiveness and barriers that, that I, th I think sometimes get put up by product management practitioners who, who don't understand UX quite so well and kind of worry about who's getting in the room and driving the, the research um, instead of them. Uh, I mentioned already prioritization, the stickies, you know, ranking things. This is something from an actual exercise. One of the uh, projects um, I was working on uh, at the state of California, a very, you know, probably done in Fig Jam, I think. Very simple, like high, medium, low uh, impact, high, medium, low effort, a bunch of things that had been suggested to uh, make make the, the feature better. I think it's a, a persistent page feedback feature you can put on the bottom of any government web, website page. So people can tell, you know, give feedback and say, yes, I found what I was looking for on this page or no, I wasn't. And give, feed, you know, actually written feedback if they want to add that in. So this is just a feature that my team, the Office of Digital Innovation built for initially for itself and is now productizing for the rest of the state. And so we had to develop a little roadmap just to get to the MVP basically before we could add it to the design system and encourage other websites to start adopting it. So this was, an, as I said, prioritization exercise where the team collectively assigned these, these uh, you know, effort and impact levels to a number of different potential features. Um, I might come back to that later because I have a couple more pictures of that one. Um, and I think again, the, the, the product manager, and I, this is actually something that, that I, I, would, I would say this to you, whether you stay on the UX side of the fence um, or if you consider jumping over to the product manager side of the fence. But um, I, and it goes back to this idea of friction right now and sometimes unclear lines about who does what or who's in charge of what.
But I think that both roles share this very common um, strength that's almost always outwardly focused, which is looking again at the user or the customer of having this like deep, deep um, uh, fascination or, or, or um, you know, uh, obsession, sometimes the product managers will call it with the customer. What does the customer want? What would make the customer happy? What, where are the pain points in the life of the customer trying to solve these, you know, these, these, these tasks or do these jobs? How could the product that, that we're making, you know, solve those pain points, heal their journey, make them the, the hero of their own story? So that there's this, you know, very deep caring and about what are the needs of this person that you're, that you're building a digital service for. Um, and I think that's true, whether you're a UX designer research trying to like understand user needs so that you can craft the right, you know, experience for them or whether you use different words as a product manager, but you're trying to understand a customer so that you can make something valuable enough that they will use it and, and continue to engage with it and maybe recommend it to other people. I think these are different mental frames for talking about very simple or simple thing, similar things. Um, but as I said, all of that empathy, all of that understanding and that desire to like get in someone else's shoes um, is almost always focused on that, that paying customer outside the walls of, of, of your business or your project or the thing that you do. And I think sometimes that same compassion or empathy or actually even work, the, the work to research and understand and to unearth pain points and to craft better experiences um, is lacking intramurally inside the walls of the business. You know, if you think about the colleagues, the adjacent people, like I'm, you're a UX designer and, you know, frankly, product management seems dumb to you. Like not everything's a product and that's weird that we're calling everything a product now. And why does a product manager tell me, you know, that even though this would be a better user experience, we can't afford to do it or we need to work on something else instead. That can all be thought of kind of oppositionally or as like, a, a you know, just a, that, that there's something wrong, that, that the wrong people are in charge or that the wrong way of doing things is ascendant right now. Um, or you could say, you know, like this is a customer of mine. They're not an end user, but I work with them. I'm, I'm, they work with me. They ask me for stuff. I deliver things to them. I ask them for stuff. They, they help me or not. And how can I make that work better? You know, like how can I learn their language? How can I understand the job they do? How can I understand what success looks like for them? And what uh, problems are they trying to overcome? What are they judged on? What are they afraid of? What are they, what are they going for? How, you know, if I, could, if I could use the same powers of understanding a customer to understand a product manager, could I make the experience of working with a designer less confusing to them, less making less hard for them to shift into a world that's alien for them and more familiar to them, more using their words, things like that. And then putting the shoe on the other foot and talking to a person who's in a product management role. Uh, and this might be a little bit easier if you've been a UX designer in the past, like I have, but when you have to tell a UX designer, I'm sorry, I know, I know why you want to do that. That would be better for the user. But frankly, we can't afford to do that because that won't actually increase enrollments. That won't increase uh, subscriptions. And we have a limited amount of engineering time and we really have to fix the sign up this week instead. I'm sorry. So like if you, if you know why UX designers, what they care about, what they're shooting for, what their problems are, what they worry about, as a pro even if you're in a different role and have to weigh other factors, you can do a better job of you know, helping them understand that, of essentially making the experience of working with the product manager a better experience. And to be honest, I think you get better, you get better products and you get better experiences that way because in some ways it doesn't do the UX designer any good to be fully insulated from that product management point of view. Uh, in some ways, it's a little bit of a desire to just stay in a self-referential design world that's very pure, um, uh, but it's somewhat, um, it's pure in the way that like a frictionless universe creates like, you know, the, the ability to, to do physics models that are close, but not actually fully accurate. Um, there's real friction in the world and money is real and, and politics are real and things like that. So sometimes when, the, when a product manager is saying no or giving you on, you know, on, on welcome news, um, they're also giving you very important information about the actual constraints in the system that you're designing for uh, that you need to understand. And so, again, this is just a, getting a little bit preachy here, but, but you know, any way you go down the road, uh, whatever career path you take or what jobs you pursue, um, I always like to kind of reinforce that we're in the same boat together. You know, whichever jobs we're doing, we're trying to make 
great software that people love. We're trying to make good experiences online. We're trying to, to make stuff that's valuable and worthwhile. Um, and uh, we actually, I like to remind people that the same exact set of skills, the same attention to detail, the same way of measuring and noticing and, 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 and creatively designing solutions for things that you use in your work for your customers can be used um, to make working with your colleagues better. Um, okay, so some of the things that uh, product managers do that um, UX designers don't usually have to do is uh, a lot of the, the kind of quasi management of engineers, I like to call it wrangling, like in the sense of cat herding, because you don't really uh, effectively tell engineers what to do. You, you enlist their intelligence to help figure out the best thing to do. You encourage them to do it. You keep them on task. You keep them undistracted and you help them do their best um, in my view. Uh, now this can often involve, like I said, some of those things that can be thought of as product owner roles, but then a lot of shops, product managers do them too, which is like the actual figuring out of which tasks belong in the backlog and which ones are gonna go into the upcoming sprint, uh, tracked in JIRA or on a Kanban board, you know, running retrospectives, demoing the things that were just made, determining whether stuff is ready to move forward or not. Um, there's, as I said, you know, these Kanban boards that you've either worked with or certainly probably seen uh, terrible things like burn down charts that uh, don't help anything and just make everybody feel guilty. Um, uh, retrospectives, I, I don't like to call them postmortems. I don't know why we need to use some sort of death metaphor to talk about looking back at the last week or two or the last project and seeing how it went. But product managers facilitate um, these kinds of things a lot of the time. Um, and like I said, they're responsible for sort of making sure that 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 what gets built is what was 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 needed. Um, that means sometimes uh, making sure that you're technologically sophisticated enough that you don't ask for naive things, that you don't seem to not understand the constraints of the stack that you're working with. Um, you don't have to be a coder or a programmer to be an, uh, to be uh, a product manager, except in some maybe excessively uh, engineering oriented tech companies where even though the product managers will never be allowed to write any code, they just pride themselves on only hiring product managers who could write code. Um, and in those cases, then you do, but otherwise you really don't need to, you know, write production ready code, but you do need to understand, you know, what's React Native and, and why would you use that or not use it? What are the problems with using that to make your interface? Or what does it mean that we're, we're our, our infrastructure is on um, AWS hosting, you know, and, and, and how does that, you know, affect our, our costs and, and our plans for failover and things like that. So a lot of it's, like I said, understanding the, the, the technical constraints you're working with so that when you are having to ask for something that the engineer doesn't necessarily want to give you or negotiate something that is, that is complex or, or nuanced, um, that you're, you're not essentially being taken for a ride, you know, that you could, you can understand what's going on and be a serious part of the conversation. Um, a lot of that, I think in some ways just involves being a geek, like sort of being up to date on engineering culture and, and the, and ways of, of describing things and, and talking in the sort of slightly, um, almost like computer oriented, um, style of communication that, that some engineers have. Um, and also being aware about estimating, you know, that you, you have, uh, you have that, that tendency to sometimes, some engineers will pad an estimate, everybody will pad an estimate if they're smart, because you never know, you know, you might be getting optimistic in your initial descriptions of what you're doing. Um, I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit, cover things. Um, yeah, and engineering, again, is a thing where you, you do need to um, build mutual respect as a product manager. Uh, you respect them, they respect you, uh, you don't boss them around. Um, and they look to you to sort of protect them from distractions and help them get clarity. Um, again, estimation can sometimes be something where you say you need the engines to back up in the two hours, they say eight hours, and you say you have, you have three, and then they get it done, and it turns out that either they're brilliant engineers or they've been padding their estimates, but you have to learn basically with all the engineers you work with, essentially how they, whether they're optimistic or pessimistic and how they assess their own efforts. Um, I've, I've worked with developers who, like a team of two where one always almost doubled the amount of time that they thought things would take. Another one was always super optimistic. Um, and somehow between them, I, I usually managed to figure out how long something was gonna take, but it took a while to learn how to adjust each of them. Um, Let's see. And then, you know, that third lobe of the original Venn diagram was the business side. And I found that, you know, some UX people have, have some business experience. Some have run, run their own 
business either in design or elsewhere so it's not completely foreign but often it's thought of as the, the thing that you're not interested in the reason you know you're a creative person you're not an accountant you're not an mba or something like that um so why would you want to be a pm but the, the and it is a part of the pm role for sure the, to be concerned with the actual running of the business um actually getting a product into the market you know understanding what, what will fit the market how big the market is where your product is you know, in its life cycle, is it, is it launching? Is it growing? Is it, is it, uh, you know, are you just kind of milking it now or is it at the end of its life? And a lot of the things that are actually about running an operational side of a business and making sure, um, you know, that things work out financially, even if you don't have total control over the, the, the profit and loss, uh, you know, statements for the, the line of business that you work with. If you're a product manager and there's revenue involved, you probably have goals around that. So there's a sort of a focus on that side of things. Um, like I said, there's this understanding how big the market that you're shooting for is and, and what percentage of it you can reasonably access over time and how those variables affect each other. Um, there's trying to make sure that your product has product market fit before you go all out. Uh, and this is usually in the early stage of launching something. Um, so uh, I mentioned there's, it, there's the revenue financial side of, of product management. Uh, this can be sometimes just figuring out how to make money. It can be figuring out how to make more money, how to optimize the, the kind of money that, that a, a product is making. Right now I'm working for the government where we don't, uh, you know, it's not transactional for the most part. We're not trying to make money. We're not trying to get subscribers to sign up, but there's still a money factor in everything that we do. Things cost money. They have to justify their costs. So it's always part of the job on some level. Um, uh, another thing is that uh, product managers, you know, spend a lot of time crunching data, looking at data, visualizing data, playing around in data packages. When I started, it was a lot of spreadsheets. Now there's a lot of really great software to do it. Um, not every designer loves numbers or playing around with quantitative stuff. So career-wise, that's something to really consider what you like to do. Um, it helps if, you, if you're not comfortable with like querying databases directly, because then you don't have to have somebody else get the data for you. Um, and it's not that hard to learn SQL or some you know, other sort of command line, things like that. Um, there's also really great database software like Airtable these days that has a, an amazingly good user interface for something as sophisticated as that. And it's another way to get and manipulate data as a product manager. Um, you know, you have to learn that you can't just put stuff out in the field and, and ship it uh, and then wonder who's using it. You have to instrument the, the, the software, meaning you have to put in little hooks to keep track of whether people made it to a certain step along the way um, and, and what the pathways are through your product and things like that. So this is a something that UX designers may be aware of this. It kind of comes up sometimes in, in the job and discussion, but it's a lot of stuff that, that product managers are very closely focused on. Um, tracking data, usage data, and also data about the rest of the world. Um, growth data, uh, the, you know, uh, helping people move through a funnel and make it all the way to the bottom, you know, all the way to th completely through the process. Um, it's not really a funnel, it just kind of looks like one. Um, and, uh, yeah heavily monitoring trends. I found that ever since I became a product manager, I'm almost always obsessed with data. I'm sitting there all the time. Um, every morning I look at the latest COVID data, for instance, or if, I, if I'm trying to get a product you know, profitable or trying to get to meet some sort of metrical goal, um, I have some kind of North Star metrics, one to three metrics that I've got sent to me in an email every morning or that I look up as soon as they go live on a website. Um, and for me, that's fun. For everybody, that, you know, that might, might not be fun for everybody out there, but to me, that's that's a good time, and, and it's sort of part of the job. Um, oh, we don't have to talk about growth metrics. Uh, I talked about prioritization already, but but a little bit more. Um, some of it is like running experiments. Uh, you know, once you've built something, you'll come up with hypotheses and ideas about how to actually um, try out different ideas and see which ones work better. Not always A/B tests, but that's one of the kinds of experiments that product managers might be setting up and running. Um, there's all kinds of different prioritization methods and models out there. Um, and they vary from shop to shop, um, but they're all in some ways about figuring out where to put your, your dollar, you know, where to get the most bang for the buck um, and how to balance large efforts with small efforts and how to keep everybody busy, um, but balance the work. Uh, and as I mentioned before, prioritization is, is the kind of thing that UX people, I think, ha have a lot of experience with making these kinds of alignments. I showed the screen before. Um, uh, product managers have to be responsible for making tough decisions. You know, everybody wants to be on the homepage. Everybody wants to be in the roadmap, but product managers have to say no. They have to say not this quarter. Uh, we can't do everything at once. So that's a big part of the job. Um, and um, not confusing it with a launch plan. Everybody wants to make a launch plan. 
I mean, everybody asks for a roadmap, but what they really want is a launch plan. They want to know when is my feature shipping? And it's okay to understand that that's what they want. Um, I'm not a big fan of lecturing people and saying they're using the wrong terminology. Either when I was a UX person, I didn't like doing that. And as a product manager, I don't really like doing that either. Um, but it's important to understand that when they say roadmap, sometimes they want to know when is this thing going to ship? But a roadmap is actually something else from a product management point of view, which is more like, what are we working on right now? What are we getting ready to work on next and queuing up? And what are the other good ideas we want to get to, but we're not going to even really get into too much detail with them yet because we're busy doing these things right now. And there's no real need for much more clarity than that. Uh, it shouldn't be feature-based. It should be based on, on sort of themes and outcomes that you're shooting for. Um, I'll share these slides afterward too. So I don't want to read lots of stuff to you. Uh, once again, here's that prioritization exercise. Um, once we got it onto the board, we actually chose the high impact, low effort things to definitely do right away. And then the medium impact, medium effort things to probably do next, consider. And then the things that were going to be low impact and or high effort, we kind of put them in this outer ring and said, you know, maybe later, maybe, maybe not at all. Um, talked about saying no already a little bit. So I guess that's just my, that's my last point really is that um, whether you go into this kind of uh, product manager job where you're going to be sitting a little bit at the, at the gates of, of saying no to bosses sometimes and uh, not being in a position to make everybody happy um, or whether uh, UX design is, is your passion for sure and you want to stick on that path, but you may still be working on teams that are called product teams, having colleagues or, who are product managers and maybe even reporting up into people with product titles. Um, then I think, it, you know, uh, either of those paths are ways uh, forward that that are completely viable and represent, to me, interesting thing. I've done them both, you could say. So um, I would encourage people to consider that one of the options, you know, as you go through this kind of a career. Um, and I guess, a, in a sense, I have an ulterior motive, which is to smuggle more UX people into the product role so that um, the lip service to UX that you often hear in product, the concern for the user and the idea that you should be good at UX or have, have great savvy about it stops being something that people just claim to be true and is actually demonstrated by the fact that they, they have training in that and they, they have demonstrate, demonstrated success. It's similar to the way that people who make the, the career transition from engineer to product manager, um, you know, sort of bring that, that credibility as an engineer into the room, at least when it comes to, you know, technical matters. Um, so that was the gist of it. Like I said, you know, whichever path you go, you know, be, be a boss, sit at the center of the Venn diagram and coordinate everything. You know, if no one in the room is up on the, has gotten up on the whiteboard to start uh, exploring the ideas everybody's talking about and helping people get to clarity, you can do that whether you're called a UX designer or a product manager. Um, and I think I'm just around the 45 minute mark. So I'm going to call it now and see if I've stunned everybody into silence or if people have questions. If you would like, you can uh, just come off mute and ask your question. There's not so many of us here that I think that's going to be a tangle. So uh, feel free. If you're shy, put your question in the chat. We'll pick it up that way. Christian, to that point that you just mentioned about, about getting to clarity, um, that is a situation I found myself in a lot and I go, yeah, this is a this is a boss moment where I can go, hey, I can help help you all figure this out. And also, I know that that's often a challenge for me um, when there's a ton of people talking, especially we've been listening to nerds debate for three hours. My brain is fried. Um, I'm trying to figure out what things I can train, skills I can pick up, things like that, that will make me more effective at being that person that I see effective products people as that they can go, aha, yeah, I'm still on top of this and I can still see this from an architecture perspective um, that late in the game. So uh, let's see if I understand the question. So, so you're, you're saying um, when things are not coherent, like when the, the conversation is reaching a point, it's wobbling, like it's going in circles or you start to realize that, uh-oh, the team no longer all knows the same thing. Like when we were a small team or at the beginning of the project, we all knew what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Now little decisions got made. And by the way, I think this often happened. I, I would actually lay it at the doorstep of the product manager uh, in an ideal world to, to be responsible for that part of it and accountable, not meaning perfect at it, but noticing when it's starting to, uh-oh, you know, I thought everybody knew, 
that we have a new deadline, but it's still important that we have a deadline. Like I recently, just to use a real example, and, and myself as a sort of failing in some ways as a product manager, the way you constantly do, um, I, I, working on a project for one of the, the sites we, we help through my, my work at the state, um, they needed something done in a really quick order, like about uh, a four week time frame. And partway through, we realized it's more complicated than the engineer sort of told me this is harder than it looks. I'm not getting support from the engineer like I thought I was. She let me know it was going to take longer. And I went back to the, the client and I said, it's going to take another week or so than we said originally you know, can you live with that? And she's like, yeah, that's cutting it close because we do want to get this in front of the legislature, but yes. So unfortunately it then kept drifting. It took more than a week, more than that. And, and every time we came back, it seemed to be expanding a little bit more. And in a recent, we sort of pulled together for a reset just like a couple of days ago. And in discussing it, I realized that the, the, the primary engineer, I had sort of failed after the initial extension, I had failed to reinforce that this new deadline though, this is the real deadline. Like I'd sort of allowed them to uh, believe or come to understand that like, oh, this is negotiable. Like if it's gonna take longer, the PM will go get me more time. And, um, you know, I could say, well, I told them the new date, I, I could get all pouty about it and go like, why do I look bad now? Cause you know, they are not finishing in time and I have to keep going to the boss and telling them it's not ready. But instead I had to look at myself and say like, oh, I failed to communicate things well here. I, I failed to keep the engineer on point and recognize that, yeah, we have a new deadline, but we got to pull out all the stops. So if the stuff's getting in your way, let me know, because I need to make space for you. And instead I was getting into this accommodative, I was negotiating and letting it roll until I was not doing my job for the person on the other side of that. Um, so all I'm saying is that all, sometimes the product manager lets that happen and need should be fixing that. And, and, and that's just like one way that things could be out of whack. There, and it, this can happen in a lot of ways. Um, but product managers don't always do that. They're not always good at that. They sometimes are better at just letting it go awry and then shifting blame or all kinds of things like that. Um, so I do think that in the breach, like if you're in a, on a team and nobody is doing that, I, I do think UX people should step into that space because I do think the role is adjacent enough to everybody else that you need, you can't do your work if all the other people that you're either directly working with or accountable to or getting inputs from, if they all have slightly out of date or no longer jibing notions about what the point is or when it's due or who it's for or what success looks like, you can't do your job right. So it'd be better if somebody else was pulling it together and you know updating the map or the, the worldview. Um, but short of that, I think, you, I think you, the thing to do is to try to just like I said, use your magic marker, you know, like, like, like not necessarily say I'm the boss now, like in a service way, say, I feel like we're getting a little bit out of whack. Can I draw a picture of what I think was the last thing I heard we were doing? You're over here doing this and I'm doing this. And then later on, they're going to plug in together. No, no, no. We hired someone to do that part. Oh, no one told me that. And then you basically like the artifact on the whiteboard or on the piece of paper becomes a, a tool of, of discussion and clarification. And maybe it's a useful map in the end and you put it on the wall and point to it, or maybe it's a throwaway napkin drawing that just helped that meeting go better. I mean, these aren't all the same level of, of thing, but I think we've all been in a meeting where we're like, oh God, this is like, those people are not listening to each other. And you have to be like, wait, let's just, you know, we can't do both of those things. It's an either or. So are we either or, or, you know, and, and, and without being a jerk, you sometimes can be the person who crystallizes that. And now it, some of this gets into psychology. I mean, if you're if you're also overwhelmed, if the chaos is is making you is is staticky for you, you may not feel like you you want to step into the middle of it and be the person who brings it all together. It, it, that that's a different question, and I don't necessarily have the the answer to that part because it gets more into like all the human dynamics of how we work together. But I think sometimes you could be the person who says, "I feel like we need this." Like even if you can't be the person to offer it at that moment, you can ask for it. You can say, like, "I would do my best work if we all had a shared understanding," and I'm worried we don't have it anymore. Can we get it? And maybe you shouldn't always be the person who has to volunteer to. To be. I think it's a. I think it's a leadership thing to do. I think it's how people demonstrate leadership is saying, "Okay, this is going to fall on the ground, so I'm going to catch it and make sure it happens." But that's just me, and I don't think. I mean, it's not part of your remit. You don't have to do that. You know? All right, any other questions? If you don't ask one, I'm going to. That usually, that usually that threat works. The threat. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, I'm going to ask my question. I'm. This is like actually two questions. I'm cheating here. Um, I'm curious to know what career paths you see a lot of uh, product managers taking. I don't. I'm. I'm imagining not that many are coming from UX design, but you know, tell me I'm wrong. Mean, what, what are the fields they're coming from? Where are they coming from? Yeah, they yeah. come from a lot of places. Sure. I mean, and and it's changed over time. So, if you rewound about. Um, you know, even 15, 20 years, the majority of product managers would be coming from a business background, an MBA or a job like a business analyst or business intelligence, or, you know, sometimes in the, in the larger enterprise um, software world, they'd be the people gathering requirements, you know, the analyst who's gathering requirements and then creating that giant waterfall plan that then is built, you know, and so, that's some of where some of the DNA of product management comes from. It also comes a little bit from product marketing and therefore from marketing. So, so from the, the, the 20th century marketing discipline just that UX shares some roots with in the sense of, you know, trying to get more scientific about understanding the, the person you're making the thing for. Um, so, so some product comes from that, that realm. Um, from uh, there, there was, especially in, I think, once the internet hit and the Silicon Valley phenomenon started, the engineer product manager archetype sort of started to emerge, the technical product manager. And that was sort of the, the hot thing for a while. I'd, I'd say a, a design trained or UX trained product manager is more recent idea than that, a more, little bit more rare, but not quite as, as uh, you know, strange seeming as it once did. Um, there's certainly a lot of people who claim to do both. Often they're just product people who just say they also do UX, you know, without really knowing UX very well. But so the idea that the that there's commonalities there, you know, are out there. Um, there are people who come from project management, you know, where there are some common, you know, some parts of the product management job do involve project management type work. Um, sometimes a project manager wants to be more involved in the actual substance of what's done and not just keeping things on schedule and keeping track. So it's a it can be a a, a job migration that becomes more you know, more meaningful or purposeful for somebody coming from that direction. And you can come into project management from just about anywhere. Um, some, pro some product managers were startup founders, maybe the non-engineer startup founder, and they, they you know, they, they went out of business or somebody bought them and the company made the CEO into a product manager. So some people end up in the, in the role that way too. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, but definitely the big three have always been coming from a business background, uh, coming from an engineering background, and now coming from more of a UX background. Uh, I, I think that those are the most common patterns I've seen out there. Thank you. Um, so the related question was uh, like the six personality traits. If you see them in yourself, you'll, you'll like this job or conversely, stay away. That's good. I, I, I um, I think that the, the number one trait, I think that seems to, I don't know if I have six off the, off the cuff, but Whatever. Um, the one that always stands out to me is, um, I'm trying to think of the, the, the nice word for it, I call it nosiness, you know, like, like, like wanting to know everything, the, the kind of person who like feels a little bit anxious if they don't know the whole picture of what they're working on uh, and every little bit of it. If you've ever been in a, on a team or in a company and some people go into a room and start making decisions. And you're like, I wish I was in that room. I, I don't even have to make the decisions. I just want to know what they're deciding. That seems to be a temperament that really is useful for product managers, partly because that obsessiveness kind of then, you know, uh, translates into like tracking down lots of small details that matter and noticing little things that, that make the difference between, you know, a really polished experience and one that's got clunky bits in it, things like that. Um, I, you know, there's this, there's this thing people talk about in product management that they call product sense. And it's circular, because like, what does that mean? Like, it's, it's defined in terms of its own self. Um, and so I'm suspicious of thinking that some people have it and some people don't have it, or that it's like a, a trait. But at least I'd say in the product management world, there is a belief that some people have a better product sense than other people. And it seems to mean almost like a, a, a gestalt insight into what will work or what, you know, what will, um, why something is good, what makes one product good and another product bad. Um, I think that, you know, there's, the UX world has a, has a lot, a strong 
vocabulary and set of heuristics around that exact subject. So I think probably the thing they're calling product sense could be UX savvy or something like that, pretty, pretty close to it. Although that might not include the bit about understanding how it's going to make money and, and last a while and things like that. Um, so I think some, uh, an, another thing is I'd say in, the positive frame is they call it a bias to action. And I would call it a certain amount of like restlessness or, or impatience, like enough talking, let's do something. You know, like, like if you have that temperament, I think it will stand you in pretty good stead as a product manager. You know, I said it before, and I, I think I can tease UX people a little bit because I, I, I have that experience. But, you know, you sometimes feel like UX people, they'd be fine with never shipping, you know, just continuing to iterate and, and keep making it better and better and better. Um, and so, uh, you know, if, if you're like, like, hey, you know, I, I want to see this thing out in the field, like actually doing something, if you have that kind of, sometimes you've been impatient with how long something is taking, then that, I think that might be a sign that you could be a good product manager. I don't know, I have, to, I have to think about it more to come up with six six, six temperaments or, or... Describe the backseat of the ideal product manager's car. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I guess when the backseat of the, of the ideal product manager's car, product manager's car has um, a box full of donuts in it uh, that they're bringing to the meeting um, because, and, and that's that's basically stealing uh, somebody else's shtick, but the... Uh, the product manager always brings the donuts is sort of one of the sayings, you know, it's, it's, it, it's sort of the service mentality. It's like, you're making people come to these meetings. Um, you know, you should be doing something to make the experience more pleasant for everybody else. Um, I sometimes like to joke in poking fun at myself way at, when I'm working with other teams, I'll say, you know, the, somebody needs to write this down or, or somebody needs to make the test plan or somebody needs to do some task. And I'll say, well, I'll do that because I don't do anything else here. You know, I don't write the code. I don't make the interfaces anymore. I just talk and have meetings and, and answer questions in JIRA and stuff like that. So I find myself like, like if you need me to empty the wastebasket, you know, it's like you need me to go talk to the boss. It's like I'm there to run around and do every single thing that's needed to make the project work. And, it, and it's not like a glamour job. It's a service job. And anyone else, uh, you, you surely have better questions than I do. Um, and I do see a question in the chat. I can speak to I, anything. I didn't. Daniel there it says, is. How right, deep? For it. How deep does a product manager go into the financial side of the product? Is that going always, or is it more at the beginning or at the end? I think I have to be careful to overgeneralize, just because, partly because of where my experience has been, and also because I know that there's a lot of different types of product management. So, like uh, enterprise product management might involve having just a handful of customers, you know, uh, where success is not necessarily selling millions in the app store or getting, you know, uh, tons of money through subscription. It might be from having two clients who each pay you $6 million each or something like that. So um, I think that product management almost always involves some awareness of revenue, some responsibilities around revenue or goals around revenue um, with some exceptions. Some would be, for instance, in startups, where um, you, you're consciously not trying to make any money yet. You're in a kind of like, just spend money and get customers and later on we'll make money. Then in principle, you could be ignoring that entirely. I still say that you have expenses and you ought to be probably thinking ahead a little bit about what you're, how you do expect to make money eventually if you do get customers. So I don't think the topic should ever be too far away from the mind of a product manager. Um, but it can vary. I mean, look, uh, it can also be kind of a responsibility level thing. I'd say like an associate product manager, an entry level product manager may not have to do any work at all to do with revenue. Um, hopefully they're learning how to do some of the modeling, how to, how to understand, you know, how to set a price or, or uh, what the different ways to, to, to charge people, you know, what the different business models that are available and out there and what the pros and cons of them are. There, there, there's, a, there's a part of the job about, that has to be concerned with that at every level, but it does, it does depend. I mean, you could do product management in a nonprofit or like right now product management for the government that I'm doing where I'm, I'm not thinking about revenue most of the time at all. We may have come to the uh, logical end of this discussion or the illogical end. Um, that being the case, I uh, want to thank you all for being here tonight, and the, the largest thanks going, going to you, Christian, 
for pleasure. sharing a, a wealth of knowledge and uh, your, your, your mind for explaining things in detail has come through very clearly. So we appreciate this so much. Uh, to the rest of you, have a, have a wonderful evening, except for Gada, have a wonderful morning and day. <laughs> and uh, hope to see some of you or all of you again at another one of our uh, community talks. It'd be great to have you here. And Christian, again, thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you, you for sharing. Sure. Thank you.